everyone, welcome to Wednesday, five o'clock, Home Cooking with Foodland. Um, I hope that everyone has made crispy gauji and char wok chard edamame, and some of you guys made some gone lo men. Um, it was really good, and I ate way more than I was supposed to, and I'm still paying for it, but it was worth it. Um, this week, uh, as we look into the next couple weeks, I thought it'd be fun to do some things that would work, I think, as great items for a Christmas get together or your New Year's get together. And of course, you know, because we're doing it in small, the gatherings, um, the items that we're focusing on today, you know, you could make them larger for when we get past the pandemic, um, but also works really great for a small get together. Or you could actually make these, uh, make a huge one. Someone told me that they're going to, this year, they're going to just make the same amount and then prepack it. And then they're going to hand them out to people. So I guess you could make really nice care packages of these and then hand them out and it'd be great. So um, we're going to be making uh, steamed clams, you know, which is really delicious and really fast to make. And if you're not, if you've not done clams before, or you've gone to restaurants and you thought that, well, this is kind of very involved. When, when we do this together, you'd be like, oh, totally easy. The key is to have lots of crusty French bread because you're going to want to sop up all those juices. Um, and then we're going to make a creamy ahi dip. Let me just check something real quick. Now the creamy ahi dip, I think is very cool. And the, the, what we're going to be doing is a version, uh, an adaptation, we'll call it, um, of a, a side that you would get when you went to Hoku's. I'm not sure if Hoku still does it, but when you used to go to Hoku's, they would bring out this little dish and it was like ahi with, I think it was like mayo and it was light and just really delicious and you couldn't stop eating it. And so there've been versions that have been uh, out there. This is the one that I put together that si simulates that. Um, and you're gonna wanna eat this like literally by the spoonful. Um, and you can if you want, but just be mindful because it's gonna, it's like, it's definitely not shy in the calories. So um, really delicious, but maybe you wanna think about in moderation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Keep in mind, right? Um, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer function um, in the Zoom app. And, um, you know, our gracious Trisha and Cheryl will answer a lot of them. Um, and if they not sure of the answer, they'll pitch them to me and then I'll make something up for you guys. Okay. So I have a pot that's heating up right now and then we're going to cut some garlic. These are garlic cloves that we have that are pre-peeled. Really great. Um, they're a great convenience item because peeling garlic's not that fun. Although peeling garlic is better, it's the freshest thing you can get, you're still gonna get a really good experience than just using bottled by doing this. Okay, so I'm just taking the cloves and I'm gonna just slice them real quick. If you wanna chop them, you can. I like to eat a little piece of garlic every so often when it's cooked through. It's just a nice, delicious, warm, metal flavor. Now the recipe that I said uses three and you can use three today. For some reason, I feel like five, feeling like it's a garlic day. I think it's cause it's a little rainy outside and it, it just, I don't know. That's the cool thing about this kind of cooking I'm teaching you guys. A lot of it's by feel and it's by preference. So if you love garlic, go for it. This is one of those dishes that will do great with that. How do you get the garlic smell off of your hands? See, that's the thing, it, you know, if you like garlic, you should be looking forward to that smell, the lingering garlic smell for the next day. Um, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of, I mean, I just wash my hands. I don't have the problem with that, but a couple of things you can do is I've heard that, like if you go fishing a lot, right? One of the ways to get the fish smell off is to use toothpaste. So put some toothpaste, use that as soap, um, that mintiness can kind of cleanse it, kind of like helping with the bad breath, I guess the idea. So maybe you want to try that, that might work nicely. But just, I think you gotta embrace the smell. Um, Okay, so we got the garlic. Let's go over here and we're gonna get this thing going. So I have a really, I have a, a, a thick gauge. Um, this is a cast iron skillet I've been preheating. I wanted to get it nice and hot. Um, I wanna talk about clams a little. These are manila clams. Now I rinse these because sometimes they have sand on them. And what you're looking for when you're looking for clams, and this is really important. If, if anything you take away from this class, it's this. You want live clams. And the way you know the clams are live is they're tightly shut like this. If they happen to be like open and if you touch them and they don't close, that means they're dead. 
You don't want dead clams. And as I as I'm going through this, I was trying to see if I could find a dead clam, but these are all really super fresh. Um, and these came from Market City, so shout out to Market City. Nice job, everyone. Um, but yeah, if you you want to see, make sure that they're all tightly closed, and that means that they're live and they're fresh, and they're gonna be delicious. Okay, so now this is getting really, really hot. I have some olive oil. I'm gonna put in here just to get the process going. And then we're gonna take that garlic that I sliced up, and then we're gonna put it in the pan here. Where did I put the garlic? See now, I'm trying. You can. I wanted to just test it. You see how it's sizzling now? So it's 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 nice and getting hot. I'll add all the garlic in, and I started with olive oil because one, I could have started with butter, but my fear is if I start with the butter, the milk solids might burn. And so I just put all olive oil to kind of get this simmering process going. And you can smell it. The garlic smells really delicious. We will be adding butter later, and that butter will be to like finish the sauce basically. But for the fat that I wanted to get this thing going with, I'm using olive oil. And I also think that the olive oil is going to add a nice another layer of complexity. Now there are two ways you can do this is one is to just dump the clams in and then hit it with the uh, white wine and it'll deglaze and you cover it and it starts simmering. I'm gonna add the wine first, then I'm gonna bring it to a simmer and we'll add the clams and we'll cover it and we'll let them do its thing. So let me go in here and grab some, uh, I'll grab the wine while that's simmering. Keone, a uh, viewer said that lemon juice or lime on hands or your cutting board will get rid of the garlic or the fish smell. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a good point. Acid, the acid will really cleanse. Um, and it really, that's the foundation of a really good dressing too. Okay, so we've got that in a slightly brown. Now I said use a dry white wine and I said like Sauvignon Blanc in the recipe. In this instance, I'm gonna be using, um, this is a sparkling white wine from Piper Sonoma in California. So now it's simmering and I'm gonna add my clams. And then we're gonna cover it. How did you clean the clams? I washed them. I just, I put them under the sink and I washed them out to get any, any sand off. Just make sure that was good. Now these are, they're really, really, really clean because of the, you know, the sourcing that we get. They're really, really, they're well taken care of already. They weren't all sandy and muddy and dirty, but if you have some sand and some dirt on them, just washing off quickly. You don't want to soak them in. Well, if you're going to eat them right away, you can soak them in water to wash them off, but you don't want to like store them in water or put them in fresh water very far in advance of when you're going to actually eat them because you'll kill them by that. Okay. You want to stay nice and, and fresh. So here they're in there now. They're simmering. And gradually you'll see, you'll start to see the clams start to pop open. And that's what we're looking for. By the way, talking about um, wine, the wine you're gonna use to make these clams should be a wine that you are willing to drink. And so don't find, don't buy the cheapest, junkest wine that you can to just throw in there because that's gonna affect the way these taste. So the key for, people always ask, look, do I have to cook a wine? Well, what kind of wine should I look, cook with? Let's see, you can hear this. I wanted to show this, look at this. See, they're starting to open up, right? They're starting to pop open. But you want to cook, you should be cooking with a white wine or a wine when you cook, you should be choosing a wine that you would drink by the glass. And this is, you know, Piper Sonoma is a really great value for sparkling wine. And the reason why I think this is great for making the clams is that I, it's, it's dry and it's crisp. And that's what you're looking for, minerally dry and crisp, which speaks well to the, to the seafood and the shellfish that we're going to be doing. Okay, so while that's going, after the clams open up, what's gonna happen is the juice from the clams open up, they go in, they mix in with the, uh, the garlic and they mix in with the wine, makes a really nice broth that we're gonna season it, hit it with butter, parsley, chili flakes, and they'll be ready to go. So knowing that that's getting ready to happen, I'm gonna take some of the uh, parsley here and just rough chop it. This is, the dish is meant to be very, very rustic, okay? Do you have a substitute for wine? Uh, if you uh, is that 
because you don't want the alcohol, or you just or you don't like wine. Both. Come real quick. Sorry. You see how quickly this thing they're all, they're all opening up. As I think about that answer, let me. I'm gonna grab the parsley. I'm gonna throw it in. A little salt. Pepper. I'm gonna cut the. I'm gonna cut off the heat. Chili flakes, if you want to add a little bit of heat, it's just a little tiny warming. And then we're gonna add butter. I'm taking sli small slices and I'm dropping them in. And I'm gonna stir this. And what I'm trying to do is get the butter to emulsify. Smells really, really nice. Couple things. If you're gonna do this dish, one fun thing to do sometimes is that I've done before is you take Portuguese sausage or you take some chorizo, throw that in, and it gives it a nice meaty texture. You can also throw in saffron, which gives it a nice earthy uh, character. One thing that I've done in the past too, which is really delicious, is when I throw in the garlic, I would also throw in um, fennel. And then instead of deglazing it with, um, white wine, I would deglaze it with Pernod or Anisette, which is a anise flavored liqueur, which gives it a really nice flavor and then throw in tomatoes, which makes a whole nother dish. But these are all different ways you can really take this dish and riff on it and really make something delicious, okay? Is it best to use salted or unsalted butter? I use unsalted butter and I recommend everyone use unsalted butter. And the reason I recommend that, give me one second here. So these are, I mean, how, eh, you know what they say, right? I was, well, I was gonna, I'm, trying, I'm, on the, I'm on the fence. Okay, I won't put that in. I'll put it in later maybe. I'll put this on the side and we'll just hold it here. It doesn't make stay nice and warm for when we're ready for it. Um, I say unsalted butter. And the reason why, the way we cook and the way that I teach you folks how to cook is about you having control. And so if you start with salted butter, you are already adding salt to the dish and you cannot control that because it's in the salt, in the butter. So I use unsalted butter because I wanna know, I wanna be able to know how much salt that I'm putting into the dish to season it. The other very important reason why I use unsalted butter is because salt is a preservative. And so butter that is salted has a longer shelf life because of the salt that's preserving it. And unsalted butter does not. So by nature of that, the unsalted butter that you buy will be fresher potentially than the salted butter because it has it can't be on the shelf as long. So those are the two reasons why you use unsalted butter. Okay, and if you use chorizo or Portuguese sausage, when would mm -hmm. you put it into the pot? Um, you can put it in the beginning, depends what you like. So you can put it in the beginning uh, when you're doing all your vegetables, your garlic to kind of like start to caramelize and get that flavor out, then you throw your clams and it adds all that broth flavor. Um, you could also like right now, I could just throw some inside there. It's going to have flavor, but when you eat, the tr when you eat the sausage, it will have a more poached or steamed quality because you did not caramelize or sear, uh, the sausage before you put it in. Okay. Can you, um, can you remind us how much wine you used and what temperature was the stove on? The, the, how much, what wine? Um, I used, uh. I used the Julia Child half a cup, which might have been like a cup. Um, so I was just my eye. I just I, I poured it enough so I could you know I see that steam coming up. It's probably about a cup. Uh, the recipe says half a cup, so it's between a half a cup and a cup, depending on your preference. Um, what was the other, what was the other question, Cheryl? How high was the heat on the? Stove? I had the thing. I had the high. I had the heat on medium high. Just enough. I, you saw how the garlic was starting to like lightly brown. I would have preferred to do it sooner. So um, to add the wine sooner so it wouldn't get as much browning. But to that point, um, medium high, when it starts to like sizzle and very lightly brown, boom, hit it with the, um, with the wine. And, and to that point, I'm using a cast iron enamel skillet because it holds heat very well. If I use a very thin pan, as soon as I pour that uh, sparkling wine in there, it would just like drop the heat and then I wouldn't maintain that. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. 
Now, there was the question about whether using wine or not. So, and then another question about whether you can use beer. You can totally use beer. Um, changes the character completely. Um, you know, uh, IPA would be really interesting. And you want to use a nice flavor. Um, if you're going to use a beer, the difference is you're just going to, it's going to be, the body is going to be heavier typically because of the, the, the beer typically has a heavier or more robust flavor. I wouldn't use anything that's dark. You know, I would go maybe a pale ale as far as an IPA because you're also trying to make sure you don't overpower the clams. And so the, the very crisp white wine really enhances and supports the clams versus masking the clams. So I think that's something you want to think about. Now back to the wine. If you don't want to use wine, uh, you can totally use stock. If you if you can make, if you, you can use clam juice, clam broth, fish stock. You can use a vegetable stock. You could make a fennel stock or you know, it'd be interesting. It would be, here's a cool one. You know, you, uh, if you do, if you, if you know, like, if you, if you were to do that, the garlic, throw some bacon inside there, right? Then hit it with a corn broth. Kind of sick of this chowder character so you see how these different ways you can go with it but chicken stock would be great and then you do that but you, you need acidity and the wine provides acidity so if you're going to use one of those stocks at the end you got to come back in with a lots of lime juice or lemon juice and just hit it with that acid to bring back that um quality that that you know when you think about seafood and that squeeze of lemon that really kind of like balances the whole thing out can you do this with mussels and what about frozen clams can totally do it with mussels. Um, you know, if I was gonna do mussels, definitely would be doing stuff like putting fennel or leeks in there. I would put saffron in that. Um, chorizo so would be really great in that. Mussels would be great. Kind of harder to find, I think, in our market in Hawaii, but um, totally can do. Uh, and some people, I don't know what it is. Some people just don't really like mussels because I don't know if it's the, you know how it looks orange on the inside? I don't know what it is, but some people just have this thing about mussels. But yes, mussels will work perfectly for this. Frozen clams would be okay, but the, the difference on that is you're not gonna get, by the time the clam, when they're frozen and you defrost them, you're not gonna get all that natural liqueur that comes out of the clam. It'll taste okay, but, and if that's all you have and that's what you're jonesing for, go ahead and make it. But I guess what I would recommend for anyone who's asking the question is go ahead and make it with the fresh clams and then make it with the frozen clams and then you can decide the difference. But these are gonna be plump tender juicy you know and sometimes frozen is is just as good as fresh but in this example i would say fresh totally trumps frozen so now we're going to start making the creamy ahi dip and the first thing i want to get going is the is the whipped cream this recipe does call for whipped cream and it does call for a quarter cup of whipped cream and i i was getting excited we we're talking about just now so i put more than that so i'm gonna whip i'm gonna whip all this but you don't need all of this, okay? And I thought it'd be, it's cool to show you how to make whipped cream because that way you, you can make it at home. And by the way, I'm using 36% milk fat. Okay, this is considered heavy whipping cream. Um, you can get regular whipping cream and I think that's 32%. And the reason why it matters is the, the extra fat is gonna help this thing whip really nicely. Now, I wanted you to show you how to do this because while I'm gonna use this for the appetizer, I want you to, this is, I want you to show how to make whipped cream because when you need to do it fresh, instead of using cool whip for your pumpkin crunch or you want to put it on strawberries or you're trying to think about, ooh, what I'm going to do for Valentine's Day and you want to take strawberries and put some Grand Marnier on there and make Romanoff or something like that, this is how you would do it. And the only difference is you would take this, once it's got nice consistency, you could add a pinch of sugar, a pinch of like a nice liqueur, like I said, maybe Grand Marnier or um, framboise for a raspberry essence. And this is kind of how we do it in restaurants when we're doing you know, some people call it schlag for, you know, like you put it on uh, pecan pie, but all that whipped cream garnish, this is kind of how we're doing it, right? We're using a, we're using a whip, I mean, a machine prop usually, but I wanted to show you how to do it by hand because it's, you can see how it starts to thicken up and I wanted to show you, it actually can be done by hand. It's not that bad, it can, work out. Can you explain the motion that you're using? Is it just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? For all of the drummers out there, I'm using the molar technique. Okay, it's named after a molar and it's usually, it's a whipping technique. So it's kind of like when you pitch a baseball using that. And so it's all about the wrist here. And so I'm, my wrist is very loose. And if you're in Switzerland, they're gonna tell you to go in a figure eight position like that. 
But in general, I'm going back and I'm going circle around it and I'm going back and forth, but I'm keeping my wrist loose. I'm not going like this. I'm not using my arm and my bicep because that's why people get tired. I can sit here and hang out with you all day because I'm just using the natural wrist of my motion and I'm using the ergonomics here. Can you use, can you use an immersion blender or a hand mixer? You can use a hand mixer. Um, you can immersion blender, you can try, but the problem with that is the blades. The blades, what it's doing is when you, when you're, which, what I'm trying to do is incorporate air and the air I'm incorporating and why the fat is important is the air, the fat gets, it's, it gets, it, it, it I'm trying to think of the, the right way to say this, it's not an emulsification, but the air and the, uh, the fat coincide with each other. And then the, the, the fat keeps the air molecules separate and I get more and more air, which makes it more light, lighter and lighter. So um, the, the reason I'm saying that is the blades here are fat. Right. If I'm using um, an immersion blender, that's usually a blade. And even if I'm using a, ro a RoboCoop or a uh, food processor, it's a blade. And you can totally do it in there, but you will notice a difference in the consistency because the blade works so fast, it's shearing it. Where this is actually push forcing the air and it's allowing the air to stay in there. Okay. You see what I'm getting now? It's how it's getting thick and it's almost holding a shape. Does it help to chill the bowl? You know, what I'm looking for is soft peak. It's, it's really runny still yet. So, and yes, chilling the bowl helps a lot. If you have time, if you can chill the bowl, definitely do it. It's gonna make a difference. And by the way, I didn't have this out, right? I had it in the fridge. I didn't have it on the table because I wanna keep this as cold as possible too. So you wanna keep it, the colder you keep this, the better you're gonna, the result you're gonna have. You remember how it was really loose before? See how it's now, this is considered soft peak because it, the peak, you see how it's bending? It's really soft. I'm gonna go a little bit further. See now, it just went soft peak. This is what you're looking for, okay? I'm gonna put this in the fridge because we're gonna need it in a little bit, but I wanted to show you how to prep that. And see, I'm not a little bit, I'm a little bit shiny, but I'm not like full on sweating, right? So. So I'll have that technique. Okay, now we're gonna dice some, some ahi. This is number two grade, sashimi grade. You can use probably number three. You wanna use something that looks, has nice color. You don't want suji. And so I pre-diced some of this. This is the number two sashimi grade that I'm putting in here. And it's because we're worth it. We're worth using this kind of, uh, this grade here, okay? So now we're gonna go ahead and dice this. I wanna show you how I diced it. So I have uh, my, my my utility knife. I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna come through here first, and I'm keeping my hand on here because it gives me control. And I'm gonna cut it in half. Okay. How many grades are there, and what's the difference? You know, I there's depending on the company. There's different variations of grade, but usually there's like number one. Sometimes some people call there's there's some people call extra fine. There's like number one, number two number three, and then you might go into fry grade. Some people call it or number two, number three, maybe pokey grade, fry grade. And so really what you're talking about, the, the smaller numbers is better quality, meaning super red, super clear, no suji. Then, you know, so you start to move into less clear, less suji. Number three, you're starting to see maybe it's more, it's a darker red, right? Um, then you start moving to like fry grade and they call it fry grade because it's starting to get, you know, the color isn't as vibrant as this anymore, it's starting to get gray and oxidized. So they're saying that this one you should cook already, right? Um, but that's kind of usually how the grades tend, tend to work. But number two, number one, number two is definitely what we would consider sashimi grade. So now I'm gonna cut these down into thin strips. And is it easier to slice it if you chill it in the freezer for a little bit like the bacon that you? showed us last can, time can it, it can i think you got to be careful with this one though because we're baking you can actually forget about it and let it freeze and you'll be fine this one you you, see, you go too long and if you let it freeze when you start to defrost what, what happens when you freeze something by the way and like if you think about if you've done raspberries and stuff you throw them in the freezer when you take raspberries and they're like you defrost them it's like just like water right uh when you think about the cell right of of the product 
it has liquid in there. But when it freezes, right, the water that's in the cell will expand and it will burst the cell. And so when you talk about something like this, if it accidentally freezes, by the time when you defrost it again, it'll just have watery and it'll be kind of mushy because the integrity of the structure of the piece of fish has not changed. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here. And so I would say you can, if you want to, to help firm it up a little bit. Um, I would I try to keep this in the coldest part of my fridge and I keep my fridge pretty cold so that I guess it would say it would, I take it to the, I try to keep my meats and fish almost to the point of crystallization, right? So where, where the potential of the product starting to freeze happens, but it never really actually freezes, except that a couple of degrees before that. Can you explain what you mean by suji? Suji, okay, so here's, when you look at the piece of fish, right? There's a sinew. And so depending on the cut of fish, like if you were to take um, a quarter and you cut it straight down, you would see all of the spirals of the fish toward the skin side where the belly portion is, you start to move into the sinew. And here we call it suji, suji is fishing line. And so what we say, we call it suji because when you eat it, right, it gets stuck in your teeth, it's like dental floss. And so that's what I'm referring to when I say suji. It's the sinew, okay? Now, one of the things about this dip that I'm gonna show you how to make is when I first, when Hoku's first opened, I recall going there and it was like a lot of fish. They used to take all the fish and this was a dish that I believe was designed because they would do all of this ahi dishes and then they have the skin and all, they would scrape it to get all the good parts off. They would make this really delicious, this, this appetizer or this pre-appetizer that you would come. And over time, I think they would start to like stretch it and stretch it and it became mostly other things and a few pieces of fish floating in this. But I figured since it's us and we're gonna do it for ourselves and you wanna do it for your friends and your family, we wanna go back to and make this really about the fish. And so that is why this recipe has a lot of fish in there, okay? Um, so we'll start adding ingredients. Uh, shoyu, right? A good amount of shoyu. And then like my, my favorite is yamasa. So We'll put that in there. And I'm eyeballing this. The recipe you guys can follow, works great. We're gonna put some lemon juice in here and I have fresh lemons. Squeeze that in. And see, here's the thing. This is not really a poke, right? Cause I'm putting acid. It's almost like a poke, but I'm adding acid to this. So it's almost, you know, ceviche-esque, but you also have to be careful when you make this, you're gonna make it and you wanna serve it pretty pretty on the spot because you're gonna to start to see oops, the acid cook the fish, right? But this acid with the shoyu kind of gives, and the, the different, the lemon and lime gives it a, um, you know, a yuzu ponzu quality, which is really delicious. We're gonna add some pickled ginger here, a tablespoon. This is about, I, and I like this, to me, I really like this part. So I'm gonna put a little bit more. I'm just gonna rough chop it. Now it depends on, like, you can go as fine as you want. It depends on how, like, if you like people to get that little, ooh, this ginger, or like make it so, so fine that there's a, you know, it's like, ooh, it's, there's something in here. There's, there's some, I don't know what it is, but it's really amazing. So. Your call. There's some Chinese parsley or cilantro here. Again, one of those things like, depending on your love or hate for it, I do think that it's, it's a must have. What's interesting as you think about this too, right? It has a sort of a, um, like a Mexican-ish vibe because you got lime juice and cilantro in here. It's really, really, it kind of has a guacamole-esque character. And as I'm cutting this right now, and I said guacamole, like my head went bing, yeah. Maybe throw some avocado in there. Okay, we're gonna depart from that, that, that now. We're gonna put some sesame oil in here. And why do you use the lime and lemon in the recipe for the acid or? I use the lime and the lemon because I'm looking for that complexity. 
And to me, when I think about yuzu, it has a lemon, you know, as a citrus, as a citron, it has a lemon lime quality. Um, if you were gonna do one only, I would say use lime instead of the lemon, because I think it has a it gives it a really interesting exotic um, kind of a flavor. Green onions we're gonna put in. And can you do this with another fish other than ahi? Um, think about that. I've not experimented with other fish. You could probably do with hamachi. I'm trying to think of really delicious, mild. I mean, like this is a meaty and oily fish, right? So you could probably do hamachi. Um, probably could do. I was gonna say, the, the challenge with the hamachi and even I was gonna say kampachi is that. It's really delicious, but I don't know. It's because it's white. I don't know if it has. It doesn't have the same meatiness that I'm thinking about. You could probably do salmon. Salmon could work because it has a similar texture, and it has a you know nice meatiness. So that could potentially work. Okay, so we've got that in here. I'm gonna do a quick stir to get it all incorporated. You can see what this looks like. And then we're gonna start adding the, the fun stuff, okay? So mayo. You might you're thinking probably this this has um reflections of like spicy ahi, but I don't have the spicy in here. I'm going for it with the mayo, right? I'm gonna put that in now, get that incorporated. I'm also pushing down a little bit on this because what I'm trying to do is get some of the fish to break up a little bit to add body to this. You could also chop some, but I'm trying to get it to be a little bit more, um, you know, bound together. And by doing this, it breaks up some of the pieces and helps bind it. What about using your food processor? Can, but see, the thing is, um, what I'm trying to do in this is demonstrate like what, what a lot of restaurants do when they make ahi tartare now or they make beef tartare. Instead of grinding it, they're dicing it because they're using really nice, high quality meat and they want to show that. Like lots of times people grind, used to grind stuff, they were like off cuts and stuff like that. So you don't get credit for that beautiful product that's being put in there. And this way you can see it. So now I have the whipped cream. I want to whip it still a little bit more. I want it a little bit stiffer because I'm looking at this and it looks a little loose. So I want it stiffer just to help with that. I'm going to put a little bit in. And this is really what's going to do. The air that's in here that I'm putting in here is going to help to just really give it some nice. And see how I'm folding it in very carefully. I don't want to disrupt that air that I put in there, but it's gonna aerate this, make it light and luxurious. And we know you love best food, best foods mayonnaise, but what about Kewpie mayo? You can use Kewpie mayo. You just gotta be mindful that Kewpie um, is sweeter. So you're gonna have some sweetness in that, in this, which would work fine. Um, you just gotta be like, if you're gonna, I would, I would not use something like Miracle Whip though, because that's not mayonnaise, that's salad dressing. And we'll just go ahead and put in a nice bowl. But see, like I was saying, if you're thinking that I was making poke or even spicy ahi poke, this is a whole different ball game. This is very rich, it's very decadent. And uh, I think the average like, person would probably want to eat a lot of this, even though you should only be eating a little bit, okay? Now, if you want, 
for, for service, right? If you want to just add a little bit of warmth, this is togarashi or sichimi or uh, seven spice pepper mix, Japanese. Add some color and some brightness. Uh, if you want to add some green onions for garnish, if you want to add some pickled ginger too, just for, again, to like make it look pretty. Green onions curls, I want to show you guys, this is how they do it in the restaurants, right? So, when you go to Roy's, right, or you go to, you know, when you get your, your grilled um, hoisin ribs and they have this garnish on there, that's what this, how they do it. Some green onions on there, and then. Um, How long you can want... you keep pickled ginger in your fridge? Long time. I mean, it's pickled, so it's preserved. Basically, it's preserved, right? So, um, I've had stuff in there for months, over a year. I mean, it's 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 sitting in sugar, and usually these days they put um, potassium sorbate, which is a preservative, but it has a lot of sugar in there and vinegar, so it's got a high pH. Um, and it's got other sugar, which really keeps it from like from going bad. So here's the ahi dip, and usually what we will serve it with is here's a couple of things you can serve it with. Um, got some chips, I got some lavash, and I got some really good baguette. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Now I'm gonna bring the clams so I can show that to you too. Now here's the clam. And this is smelling really, really good. See all that? That's the broth, that's the flavor, okay? You can put basil in there, it's got really cool too. But so let me grab a bowl real quick. I wanna show you what that looks like. So you could serve this like this, or you could have, you know, you get a nice bowl of these. Clams back where they came from. I want to put a little more sauce in here. And this is that part I was talking about. This is the best part. This is that wine and all of that juice that came out. Okay. And then, you know, what I would do typically is take a hunk of bread, put it on the side here, right? Take some more parsley because that's really going to be brightening the dish up. We'll throw some on there like that. I'll take a nice lemon wedge. Put it in here for, for the person that's going to enjoy that. And then I like, I'm all about balancing that. I like that heat, that chemical, that, that warming there. So put a little bit on there like that. And just for fun too, as I'm looking at this, if I want that little bit of additional texture and richness and also character, you know, this is extra virgin olive oil. So I would also maybe put a few drops in there, which really kind of gives it that nice olive and a green character to that. So then I would have, that's that's one thing that you can serve for your small small group get together. And then we have the ahi dip that goes together like that. So two really fun dishes. And, and this actually, you know, look how quick this went. You know, we started and it's been a quick class. Let me show you, I'm gonna demonstrate one thing for you. So you take the bread here, take some of this, put it on here like that and really good are there any last minute questions that we or can answer while <laughs> your mom we'll is, is this how you would make linguine with clam sauce or is that mm. a completely different uh dish the sauce is different or so linguine clam sauce similar so what i would do is yeah same thing well i would start with the pan 
hit it with the garlic, go ahead and throw other things, sausage or whatever, throw the clams in, hit it with the wine, let it, let it reduce. And then when the clams are all open, I would eat, add more butter and I would add more stock and I would emulsify that. Then I would reheat my pre-cooked pasta, put that in, toss it together, season it with salt and pepper on the plate. And so you put the pasta in the middle and you take all the shells and the clams if you want and arrange them around. Grate some Parmesan cheese, a little bit of this. Delicious. Any other last minute questions that, you know, yes. holiday planning and prep? Oh, uh, viewers are asking about the togarashi. Can you uh, explain what you put on top of the ahi dip? Yeah, so this is togarashi. Um, it's also called shichimi, and it's an assorted chili pepper seasoning. In Japan, they use this for like when you have it ramen and stuff. And so basically, it has chili pepper. It's got some orange peel, black sesame seeds, white sesame seeds, Japanese pepper, a little bit of ginger, some seaweed. So it has a lot of umami. It's got heat in there. It's got very bright tones, little bright tones from that orange peel. And so if you look at it here, I'll put a little bit more on. It just adds a really nice complexity. It's not just hot. Um, and it's really great in ramen. It's a great seasoning. Okay, and if you wanted to start with poke and, mm -hmm. and do a poke dip, mm -hmm. how would you do that? It sounds like it would be easier. Totally easy. Um, so like if you go on foodland.com, I got a recipe. But basically the riff on that is you take the poke that you like and then you chop it all up. And in that recipe, I think I added um, a little bit more sour cream. I added a little bit more mayonnaise, but I use sour cream instead because that's easier to get um, and you don't have to whip it. So there there are hacks, right? You guys are already moving into what are the hacks. I'm showing you, I, this is the Kahala Hotel riff, right? This is like the five-star riff. You want to do your own version, a quicker version, like I would go get the shoyu ahi poke, chop it all up, throw it in the RoboCoop. Someone is asking about, a, I mean, I say RoboCoop, but a food processor. And I hit it with the lime juice and I would add, you could add sour cream or creme fraiche, you know, any of those dairy, like smoother. You could probably add yogurt. The only thing about yogurt is you gotta be careful because if you use the wrong yogurt, it has that, that, that bite, right? So I would say you might want to think about that, but you can totally use poke. It's a great way. It's a great fast way to get this, get this, get something like this on the table. Just chop it up, add this in, and you're good to go. But 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 I would I still would say when you have the time, if you have the time, it's worth making it this way because that way is good. But when you make this one, you'll be like, wow. And this will become the one you're like, okay, if you're really special and I really, really like you, I make this version. If I gotta make 10 pounds, I may make the other version. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It was it was a quick class, but I wanted to. But it's just good to show you folks that you can get elegant dishes on the table very quickly too, with not a whole lot of ingredients. So please, I hope you guys make it. Again, send me those pictures. Um, this one here, great, great for Christmas, but really good for for New Year's Eve get together. So please make them. Send us your feedback, and uh, just as a as a quick note. Because next week and the following week are big holiday weeks, we're gonna instead of doing the, the two week rotation, we're gonna skip another week and we're gonna we're gonna jump into January. So um, January sixth is when I'll see you folks next. And with that, I want to wish everyone a very happy holiday season. I hope you guys have a great uh, great Christmas and we have a great you know we'll we'll sign off this year and uh, we look forward for a great 2021. We'll see you guys. Thanks.